In this video, I'm gonna show you how to paint a still life, especially under painting stages, using a modified layer technique of the old masters. Enjoy the show! They said I had the fastest gun around, but one day I got messed up with the wrong people. They took away everything that mattered to me. Now it's time for my revenge. This painting is a complex puzzle of underpaintings and color layers that shine through each other and create effects that you cannot achieve with other techniques. So that's why I really enjoyed the process of this painting. It took me almost one year to finish this painting, not because I'm lazy and slow, but because I was working on other paintings in between. Thanks to this, there were enough time for the individual layers of the painting to dry. What was interesting about the whole process was that I planned in advance the places where the underpaintings would show through and thus form the overall look of the painting. For example, the texture of the wood is essentially made up primarily of a visible sublayer of Imprimatura burnt umber on which I later applied a monochromatic underpainting in some places. Later in another layer of paint, the wooden table was overpainted with local color. The overall texture of the wood is therefore made up of four layers of paint, which gives it greater depth and more realistic appearance. On the other hand, the texture of the paper on the wall was painted with monochromatic grey underpainting, which gives the paper a visible texture. This was created by using lead white oil color. Before you start, you obviously need to get all the stuff you want to paint. For this purpose, I bought a non-functioning model of the Colt 1851 Navy revolver. The Navy revolver was suitably sized for carrying in a belt holster. It became very popular in North America at the time of Western expansion. Of course, I also had to get a proper holster for a proper gun. 
I had it custom made by a local tanner. After I got the other stuff, like the sheriff star, candle and the cartridges, I started putting the composition together. As you can see, the main part of the composition is a coat and a holster. I tried several different variations when setting up my subject. In the case of composing still life, it is possible to successfully follow a simple principle. The vast majority of classical works have a more or less scheme of a triangle. All important objects usually lie inside the triangle. Sometimes the scheme is supplemented on the opposite side by another object to balance the whole composition. The first layer of oil paint in the classical layer technique is the so-called imprimatura. It has several different functions. The first is to reduce excessive tonal contrast. Colors applied on a white surface appear much darker than they really are. Therefore, it is always better, especially for beginning artists, to always remove the white color of the canvas by toning it with an earthy warm hue. The second function is the isolation of the surface in order to reduce its absorbency. The classic chalk base, which was used more in the past, has the property that it absorbs the color very quickly and thus make it impossible to mix it easily on the canvas. In premature, I eliminate this problem. Despite the fact that I used a more modern acrylic base instead of chalk gesso, the imprimature has the same function. Acrylic gesso absorbs too much paint similar to a classic chalk base and therefore the surface of the canvas needs to be saturated with oil before I start putting colors. In previous workshops I talked about the fact that imprimature should have a tone of value approximately the same as the lightest spot in the finished painting. However, in the case of the painting of the still life, I used a slightly dark imprimatur and to some extent violated the principles of the seven layer technique. A darker base is more suitable for a dark style of painting and allows me to work in the next underpainting on lighter values that expand the value scale. At the same time, thanks to the tonal contrast, I can better compare the values of the light subjects in the painting. The color for the imprimatur should have an olive hue. In this case, I mix the color as usual from yellow ochre with the addition of ivory black and a small amount of lead white to speed up the drying process. A small amount of burnt umber in the mixture will also speed up the drying of this first underpainting. In order to follow the basic rule of oil painting, the imprimatur must not contain too much oil, so I only dilute the paint with the turpentine with a small addition of derma varnish. Preparing an imprimatur is a really simple process. I spread the linseed oil evenly over the entire surface of the canvas with my hand. After spreading the oil on the canvas, I wipe off the excess oil with a dry cloth or even better with a makeup sponge. Only a weak layer of oil remains on the surface of the canvas, on which the paint glides better and spreads more evenly. Using a large flat brush, apply the oil paint evenly over the entire surface if possible. If necessary, I use a large fine natural bristle brush to spread the paint over the canvas more evenly. For this purpose you can also try a large flat brush with nylon bristles, which I also used in this case. When you are done, let the paint dry on the canvas about 14 days. Avoid the dust that may settle on the surface of the canvas. If you expose the canvas to direct sunlight, it will speed up the drying process by about a week. Then you can transfer the drawing to the canvas using oil paint. The same rules apply to umber underpainting as for imprimatur. Before starting a work on the umber layer, I first cover the canvas with an oil and after saturating the surface, I wipe off excessive oil same way as I did before. Even though I transferred the original drawing, I decided at this stage to move the position of the paper on the wall to better balance the whole composition. So 
So I drew the new position of the paper straight with the brush and also drew the adhesive tape that the paper is stuck to the wall with. I purposely left the paper tape slightly stick out in the corners to give it a third dimension and create the illusion of depth. Next, I indicated the cast shadow of the paper on the wall. Below and to the right is a cast shadow from the main light source. And at the top of the paper is a cast shadow from the candlelight. These shadows visibly separate the paper from the wall and make the paper stand out better. Let's talk about a little bit more about the purpose of the amber underpainting. Amber underpainting is used for the initial distribution of lights and shadows, and above all for the creation of the first details. Monochrome underpainting with amber usually follows the imprimatur. Burnt amber is permanent fast drying color, especially suitable for applying in thin glazes. The amount of pigment and thus the resulting value can be achieved by adding or removing thinner, which is made from turpentine and small amount of dimmer varnish. When glazing, the paint is applied in almost the same way as working with watercolors. The degree of transparency of the paint is therefore influenced by the amount of thinner used. The working medium for this underpainting is essentially the same as for the imprimatur. It is composed of turpentine and a small amount of dimmer varnish. The ratio of both components is about 90% of turpentine and 10% of dimmer varnish. As usual, I'm applying paint to the largest areas in the background first. During the painting, I'm moving forward towards the subject in the foreground. It's not necessary to always proceed this way, but I personally like to have a certain system during painting that I always stick to. I'm applying the background color with a flat, rounded bristle brush, trying to spread the amber as evenly as possible. If necessary, I'm correcting the outlines of the drawing with a dry brush made of natural red sable hair or synthetic hair. After applying the amber in the larger areas, I blend the color with a large flat red sable brush. As you can see, the entire glazing technique is based on this principle. I mean, applying paint with the brush and then spreading and blending the paint on the canvas with a dry brush. Sometimes the blending process takes a more time than applying color. Now I'm working on a small cast shadow from the belt on the wall on the right side of the painting. As you can see, the edge of the cast shadow is sharpest near the belt. The further the shadow is from the subject, the more blurred the edge of the shadow is. I quickly fill the entire plane and then with a dry bristle brush I create a certain texture with horizontal strokes that will represent the wood. I'm purposely using a bristle brush for this. A sable hairbrush would spread the color too evenly. The random horizontal brush marks in the umber layer will remain visible through the upper color layers. This will enhance the impression of the texture of the wooden table. You may have noticed that in this underpainting I'm only working on cast shadows and big flat areas of the painting. I'm not working at all on smallest details like in the previous workshop. I wanted to simplify my work and speed up the layering process. I had planned to create the simplest possible underpainting 
and gradually add details in other color layers. In the next part of this video you will find out whether it was worthwhile for me to skip the detailed underpaintings. The next step of the layered process is grey underpainting, so called grisile or sometimes dead layer. This next underpainting is made up of natural shades of grey color. Among the essential functions of this underpainting is the building of texture for subsequent color layers. It is applied mainly in thick layers which are involved in modeling shapes and building a third dimension. It is because a large number of paints are transparent and you cannot create a thick layers with them. As usual, I'm starting work with the largest area, which is in this case the paper on the wall. The consistency of lead white is quite thick, so I dilute it with a small amount of turpentine. With a flat bristle brush, I'm applying a thicker layer of grey paint, which is made up of lead white with the addition of ivory black, yellow ochre and burnt amber. Lead white is fast drying color and is therefore the most suitable color for underpaintings. Video instructions on how to mix the color for the grey underpainting can be found again in my previous video workshop. As you can see, I apply the paint in fairly thick layers that preserves the visible brush strokes that give the paper texture and the impression of body mass. The value of the paper is much lighter than the value of the imprimatur and burnt umber underpainting. Thanks to the tonal contrast, I can easily determine how light the paper needs to be painted. At the same time, by adding a light value, I will expand the available range of values, which was initially limited by the value of the imprimatur. Always, it's better to work with lighter values on a mid-tone surface in order to expand the value scale to its maximum potential. During the painting, I stick to the contours of the drawing and if necessary I'm connecting the edges with the dry brush. After applying the paint, I blend the edges to get rid of any sharp edges. Again, sometimes blending takes more time than applying the color itself. Because the paper on the wall is slightly bent, the left part of the paper is slightly deviated from the main light source. Therefore, there is not as much light as on the right side of the paper, and its value is slightly darker here. In the final stage of the paper painting, neither the umber layer nor the imprimatur will be visible. That's why I'm applying lead white in opaque layers. As you will see later, I'm going to use a different approach for painting the background. The transition between the lighter and darker parts of the paper is very gradual. That's why I blend both values at the same time during painting and applying the paint.
the value of the adhesive paper tape is basically the same as the value of the paper. The place where the tape is stuck to the paper is only visible thanks to the shadow it casts. The candle flame is the brightest spot in the painting. In order to achieve the illusion of light, I'm using almost pure white color, which will contrast strongly with the darker background. At the same time, I'm using a thick, almost undiluted paint so that the texture will be visible in the finished piece. As always, I'm blending all the sharp edges. In the case of candle flame, this blending is even greater to create the illusion of bright light that literally overflows into the background. While watching me paint, let's talk about more of the purpose of grey underpainting. Not every oil paint is suitable for the formation of thick pasty deposits. This is why the function of the lead white underpainting comes into play. Not only does the underpainting serve as an optical basis for other color layers, but it also forms the foundation for future texture and weaker color deposits. This layer usually follows an upper underpainting. It can also be made directly on the imperature. Gray underpainting is used as a preparatory stage for the subsequent application of color layers. The key function of this underpainting can be found mainly in the half tone, where the grisaille can remain almost exposed. Translucency of grisaille through the colors causes the colors to have lower chroma. So, in the areas where light passes in the shadow, the grisaille should be repainted only with a thin layer of paint. As I said before, other function of this grey underpainting is to build up texture and pasty deposits of paint before applying color layers. The color for grisa is usually mixed from the same colors as Imprimature. Yellow ochre, burnt amber, ivory black and lead white. Grisaille can have a warm or cool neutral hue. The temperature of resulting grey color can be controlled by adding burnt amber or a small amount of Prussian blue. When painting Grisaille, I'm always applying the paint on the illuminated part in pasted thick layers and in the shadow with a thin semi-transparent layers. As I already mentioned, same way I apply grey color to the wooden tabletop, I apply the grey underpainting to the background. I'm trying not to cover completely the previous layer of burnt umber. The local color of the wall will have a relatively warm hue in its final appearance. The cooler hue of the grey underpainting will be visible through color layers and thus enrich the overall local color of the wall. Visible cooler underlayer disrupts the monotonous appearance of the finished background. At the same time, the partially visible umber together with a thick layer of grey underpainting will create an interesting wall texture. In the shadow area, I apply a more subtle and translucent layers of grey color. 
The visible amber will warm up the color mixture I will apply later in the subsequent color layer. The presence of a cool color in the shadow will give the appearance of airiness. On the contrary, warm colors add depth to the shadows. Therefore, if you are painting any cast shadow or body shadow, for its realistic appearance it's necessary to balance the presence of warm and cool colors. As you may have noticed, during the painting I always stick to the same procedure. I always proceed in the same way, applying paint with a brush and then using a dry brush to correct the edges and individual transitions. Lead white is fast drying paint, so I'm working relatively quickly. If necessary, I'm also using my fingers for blending or wiping off the paint. Now I'm applying the grey underpainting to the wooden table only in certain selected places. As has already been said several times, I'm leaving these places visible even through the color layer, which I'm going to apply in the next phase of the whole process.
When the underpainting is done, I let this layer dry again at the sun for at least one or two weeks. The longer the better. After completing all the underpainting layers, I plan to finish the painting in two color layers. I start by painting the belt, where I apply the color directly on the imprimatur. My idea was that the imprimatur will be partially visible and will show through the local color of the belt, creating a more interesting texture. However, I had to face a few different unexpected problems while applying the paint. The first problem was that the imprimatur did not take color well and it was difficult to paint directly on it. However, the more fundamental problem was determining the right value, temperature and hue of the local color of the belt. This problem is related to the relative appearance of colors. As you probably know from the basics of color theory, the appearance of colors is fundamentally influenced by many factors. If you want to learn more about this, I suggest you to watch my older video that deals with this issue. Because the imprimatur has a warm hue, and in addition the brown belt is surrounded by a warm hue of burnt umber, I don't have the possibility to objectively compare the local color of the belt to the surrounding colors. I have not been able to determine if the belt color is selected and mixed correctly. On the top of that, there was another problem. Although I used a darker imprimatur than usual, the value of the first underlayer was still quite light compared to the value of the local color of the belt. When I was applying the dark brown color mixture, the visible imprimatur lightens the local color more than I expected. So all these factors made it difficult for me to determine the correct local color. Because I still couldn't decide if the color I was mixing primarily from burnt umber was warm or cool enough and has the right hue, I decided to do something different. First, I scraped the painting off with a rubber squeegee. As you can see, I applied one of the advantages of layered oil painting. Because I apply the paint to the dry surface, I can make corrections that are not possible using the direct painting methods. Later, I decided to proceed the same way as creating an underpainting. I apply a dark local color over the surface in a subtle transparent layer to see how the color looks overall. This procedure would normally work, but another unexpected problem occurred. Thanks to the dark color, the outlines of the underdrawing were not visible. In the end, I decided to restore the original underdrawing with a brush and to paint the belt first with a grey underpainting, which will better accept the subsequent color layers. As you can see, after all these mistakes, I went back to the usual procedure that always works. Although I didn't plan it at the beginning of the painting, I made an underpainting of the finer details in this next phase of the painting process.
After the drawing dried, I applied a flat layer of umber to the belt to reduce the value of the imprimatur. Subsequently, after the umber dried, I also finished the grisaille on the belt. This completed the entire underpainting and the painting was ready for the application of color layers.